Hi again everyone. In this video we're going to discuss double integrals in polar coordinates and as we go along you're going to see how to describe regions of integration in polar coordinates, how to set up double integrals in polar coordinates and how to evaluate them. But before we get to the example, think back to your high school calculus. Hopefully you can remember that a change of variables or a substitution can greatly simplify complicated integrals. And this video is going to explore this idea in the more general environment of double integrals. And in particular, we're going to use a specific substitution involving polar coordinates. So let's just refresh our memory on polar coordinates. So if I'm at a point in the xy plane, then this point has a distance to the origin that I'm going to uh, denote by r, and you can see we can form an angle to the positive ox axis, which I'll denote by theta. Now r and theta are known as polar coordinates, and the relationship between the two sets of coordinates is the following. So now we're a little bit refreshed on our polar coordinates. Let's consider the following example. Now, essentially we're going to make a substitution in here, but the difficult thing about this problem is the actual region of integration and describing it in polar coordinates. So let's spend a bit of time discussing this because it's an important part of the problem. So I'm going to denote the region of integration by omega. And I can see from the upper and lower limits that in Cartesian coordinates, our omega is all those uh, y's between 0 and 2, and x is between these two functions of y. Okay, so the first question is, what does this region actually represent? And it's not clear, maybe you can see it, but it's not immediately obvious what this region geometrically um, represents. So what I'm going to do is actually use, um, um, I guess, different inequalities to show that this region actually represents a disk. So I'm going to work on with these inequalities here. So from these two inequalities, I can form the following inequality. And I'm going to work with this and show that actually, geometrically, um, this inequality represents a disk. So let's rearrange. And then I'm going to, if I rearrange and then complete the square, in y, I'm going to get the following. So I take half the coefficient of y, square it, add it, and then well, add it to both sides. OK, so over here, I now have a perfect square. So I can factorize here and form something that you should recognize. Now, this looks a little bit like the equation for a circle, but remember we have an inequality sign here. So this is actually um, an inequality that represents a disk with radius 1 and center at x equals 0, y equals 1. Okay, so we've identified our region of integration. I'm going to draw 
just a quick sketch down here. So our region of integration is this point, or I guess this uh, disk here. Okay, so all the points that lie within this disk. In particular, note that all the points are bounded by this circle when we have equality up here. I'm going to use that to describe the region in terms of polar coordinates. So now we would like to describe our region of integration in polar coordinates r and theta. So let's draw a slightly larger picture. And the boundary or the curve that actually encloses our disk has the following equation. Okay, so the challenge now, can we describe all these points in this disk using polar coordinates. Well, let's do the easy part first. Think of the angle. If I start along the positive OX axis and I do a half turn, then the region will be completely covered by that half turn. So the bounds on theta will be 0 and pi because it's a half turn. Now the more challenging um, uh, upper and lower bounds involve the R. Okay, obviously R has to be greater than or equal to 0 but the upper bound on R is tricky. Some of you may look at this and go well R is between 0 and 2. Not true. It's more um, involved than that. So what I'm going to do is actually describe this circle using polar coordinates. And I can see that R never R is bounded by this circle. So I'm going to use that as my cue to try to describe this in terms of polars. So what I'm going to do is make a substitution, x equals r cos theta, y equals r sine theta. Okay, so just substituting in, I'll get r squared cos squared theta plus r sine theta minus 1, all squared, equals 1. So what I would like to do now is simplify. I can expand this bracket and use r squared cos squared theta plus r squared sine squared theta equals r squared. And then I'm going to get something a little bit like this. Now when I expand the um, 1 out here, I can cancel those off, so I get a 0 on the right hand side. So factorising, I get the following. Now either r equals 0 or r minus 2 sine theta equals 0, but if r equals 0, this is just the origin, so that certainly doesn't describe the circle up here. So let's ignore r equals 0. and form r equals 2 
sine theta. So this is the polar description of this circle here. Now you can see that R cannot be bigger than, or it can't, I guess, cross this circle. So R has to be less than or equal to 2 sine theta. So let's put everything together. So in polar coordinates, omega is just, okay, so I can take my bounds here for theta, and r is between 0 and 2 sine theta. Okay, so we spent a lot of time doing that, but we can now set our integral up. So this is the substitution. We make the substitutions x equals r cos theta, y equals r sine theta, and dA, which can represent dx dy or dy dx, it's just the area element, gets replaced with r dr d theta. So let's think back to our original problem and transform via a substitution. Okay, so we've got our limits of integration here. So let's write them down first. And then we replace x with r cos theta, y with r sine theta. And we replace dA with r dr, d theta. So now it's just a matter of cleaning this up and integrating. So firstly I can clean up in here, I'll get um, the square root of r squared. So if I combine that with this r over here, I'll get the following. And just like you would with normal double integrals, you work your way from the inside integral to the outside integral. So you perform the inside integral first. So integrate with respect to r. I'll get the following. And when I substitute in, I'll get the following. So now I have a single integral, and I've got a power of a trig function to integrate. So um, essentially I'm going to have to break this sine cubed theta up into another combination involving sine and cos and then integrate. Now hopefully you would have seen this technique in first year but um, if not you can see it now. So this sine squared theta will then be replaced with 1 minus cos squared theta. This is all going to aid our integration. So if I expand that bracket, I'll get the following. Okay, so I can integrate the first term and I can integrate the second term either by inspection or by a substitution. I'm going to do it by inspection and that's the way I recommend. So. We're going to get something like this. This is going to go to positive one third cos cubed theta. So, what I need to do now is 
sub in and simplify. So if I do that, I will end up with the following answer. Okay, so that's the problem finished. You can see it was quite long and we spent a lot of time on the region of integration. So let's look at the bigger picture. Well, when working with double integrals and moving to polar coordinates, the following three substitutions are useful. And as you saw from the example, it's generally a very good idea to sketch the region of integration so as to better understand the geometry of the problem and have more um, have a greater chance of describing it in polar coordinates. So here's an example that I've given you to uh, work with. It's important that you learn maths by doing maths, so I'll leave this example for you to do.